Yeah, I, I think we can go. So, uh, so now as your church. Now as your church, we lift our voice and
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice and be glad in it. Well, good morning and welcome to our service of worship here at Ohio UP Church on this Labor Day weekend. And glad to see all of your faces here. Uh, I look forward to seeing all of you, wherever you may be, uh, online there. Um, but a few quick announcements this morning as we begin. Uh, there is a whole lot beginning to, to kind of get started once again as the program year starts up here at the church. And so uh, in your order of worship, there is a calendar of things going on over the next couple of weeks. And I just want to highlight a couple of them real quick. The first is next Saturday, the 10th. There will be uh, a church work day, um, 10, uh, 9 o'clock here. Usually there's some treats, some donuts and coffee and such to, you know, fuel the body for work. Um, but all are invited to come help. Uh, there's plenty of projects around to kind of get done. Um, but all are invited to come help on the work day, Saturday at 9. Uh, and then Sunday, the 11th, is rally day. Kind of the, we're re-kicking off our sort of Christian ed year. Um, and so we'll have Sunday school for the kiddos as usual during worship. Um, but adult Sunday school will start back up at 9 a.m., uh, in the library down the hall. We'll be working and studying through a book called Sailboat to Church. Uh, and so I invite all of you to come join and uh, learn. The other thing is uh, there's a new liturgist sign-up sheet outside of my study there on the black, or on the, um, what do you call it? The board, cork board? Yeah. Uh, sign up for liturgists. Any can any can do it. Um, also, there will be a fire drill in September. Remember, we did one last summer. We're going to do another one just to keep it fresh in our minds. And so, you've been forewarned. Some Sunday in September, we'll have another fire drill. Um, so, be excited and ready. Uh, and like a good stewardess, pay attention to where your exits are. The nearest one may be behind you, right? Um, and finally, the uh, safety and wellness team has purchased and, and gotten three, they're called life vacs, right? It's sort of um, rather than if someone is choking, it's kind of like a, a suction cup thing that you put over their mouth and then you can pull out whatever is in there. Um, so there will be one in the nursery, there is one in the, the main Sunday school room downstairs, and then there's a first aid kit right here in the hallway uh, underneath the mailboxes and underneath the desk, and there's another one in there. Um, and so if, if any time anyone's choking, whether it's an adult or a kid, there's different size masks, um, but those will hopefully help facilitate keeping people healthy and alive. <laughs> uh, any other announcements that I might be forgetting this morning? Well, we are excited that you have heard God's call on your life to gather together to worship and to be shaped and formed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. As we begin our worship this morning, we begin with a prayer followed by some music as we settle our hearts and our minds on the worship of the living God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give thanks for this day. For your call on our lives as we gather here, we pray, Lord, that you would open our ears to hear your word for us. We pray that you would open our eyes to see you at work. We pray that you would open our minds and our hearts to be shaped and molded by your spirit. Lord, we give thanks that we can gather and give you praise. And we pray this in Jesus' name and to his glory. Amen.
Thank you, Shirley. For all those who are able, would you rise, join me in the call to worship, responsively calling each other to worship our living God. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Now let us show how much we love God by using the unison prayer of adoration. Let us pray. Too often, O oh God, we pray, listen, Lord, for your children are speaking. Today, help us to pray, speak, Lord, for your children are listening. Help our ears to hear your word. Help our hearts to trust what you say. Help our hands and feet to do what you call us to do. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is the new hymn of the month, um, and Allie and Andrew will be leading us.
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and truth is just not in us. But when we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin to God and to each other using the prayer of confession printed in the bulletin, followed by a time of silent confession. Lord, sometimes our lives have such little focus. We have so much to do. We possess so much stuff. We're driven by our need for still more, and it easily seems to control us. We're sorry, Lord, for how distracted we may become and for losing our way without even realizing it. We're sorry we ignore the poor, the marginalized, and the forgotten. Forgive us and help us to know that you are the only one we need. Give us the strength to give you glory by reaching out to all people with your love. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we are assured that there is no sin so terrible that God cannot forgive, no hurt so terrible that God cannot heal. God accepts, God forgives, and God sets us free. Receive the forgiving love of God and know that in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we are all forgiven and we are all being made whole. And all God's people said, Amen. to jump into our scripture reading this morning because we are all going to be God's children today. Uh, we all get to hang out and hear, hopefully, uh, God's word. But we're kind of, we're making a little bit of a shift. We're still using a little bit of Luke, but we're looking to the fall and we'll be working on a series on what does it mean to be a disciple uh, or a follower of Jesus. Um, and so we begin this week with just looking at the call to discipleship, the call that Jesus has to the crowds to be his disciple, um, and we'll work through over the next few months leading towards Advent uh, different sort of characteristics of those who follow Jesus. Um, and so, you can follow along in your Bibles uh, and the pews, you can follow along on the screens, um, but take it away. The scripture this morning comes again from the book of Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation 
and then is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. This is the word of the Lord. So we were talking about this uh, little text in the Marlette house the other day, um, and we were talking about how it's kind of hard, right? Because Jesus seems to be saying something a bit odd, right? Because he starts by talking to this big crowd of people, and he basically says, listen, if you don't hate your parents, if you don't hate your siblings, um, you can't be my disciple. So, I have a question. Does that sound very Jesus-like? Yeah? Joel? Okay, buddy. We're going to have a good conversation. It, it, it does because Jesus says, no, 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 I'm the most important thing. But it doesn't sound very Jesus-like. Right? You, I mean, usually we think of Jesus and we think of, like, love. Listen to your parents. Love your siblings. We don't often think about Jesus saying, you know what? If you want to follow me, if you really want to follow me, then you've got to hate all these people. It just doesn't really seem to make sense. And so we need to kind of look at our context a little bit. Right? Jesus has been, um, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about these stories where Jesus is at a uh, Pharisee's house. And he's talking to those who are really serious about their religion. Uh, and, and he's kind of doing things on Sabbath days that really kind of make the religiously serious sort of upset. But he's talking to very specific groups of people. And at the very beginning of our section this morning, in verse 25, it talks about there are large crowds traveling with Jesus. So this is a massive crowd of people following Jesus as he makes his way to Jerusalem. Um, and so this isn't, this is a message for everyone. Right? Because uh, Jesus is very he's truthful. He, he's, he's not trying to trick anybody into following him. Right? This is a challenging text because it's a text about priorities. Right? What is our priority in life? Because it's easy to follow along when there's a whole crowd of people following but if that crowd dissipates, if things get hard, it becomes more and more difficult to follow. And so Jesus is saying, you know what, this whole crew of people that are following me, and it's really easy because there's a lot of excitement and there's good things going on. Listen, all of you, this is going to get hard. It's going to get hard. What are you going to do when it gets hard? What the text isn't saying what the text isn't saying is Jesus is not telling all of these people, you know what, You're, you have to hate your mom. You have to hate your dad. You have to hate your wife or your children or your brothers or sisters. Right? Jesus is not saying that human relationships, that family relationships are bad and prevent us from following him. Right? Jesus is not saying that our human and family relationships are bad. They are an essential part of being human and being a disciple and follower of Jesus. And why do I say that? Because the nature of God himself is relational. Right? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Holy Spirit loves them both. They all love each other. There's three unique persons. We don't read anywhere in Scripture where it says Jesus hated his dad or that God the Father hated his son. John's gospel talks about this a lot, about how the son loves the father and the father loves the son and the son only does what he sees the father doing. And so Jesus must be doing something a little bit different here. 
Right? He's not saying that our relationships with our parents are bad. But he's talking about priorities. He's saying, you know what, sometimes we can worry so much about making somebody love us or making somebody else happy that we lose sight of what's really important. We lose sight of following Jesus. And if that's not enough, way back in Luke chapter 6, Jesus has already told his followers um, to love their enemies. Right? In Luke 6, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Right? Hate doesn't mean that we treat somebody bad or that we mistreat them or that we hurt them. Right? Jesus isn't saying to destroy all of your relationships with your family and those who are closest to you. He's saying, I am the first priority. I am the first priority. And it's going to get difficult. You know, sometimes it's really easy to go along with the group and to follow things when things are going really well. Right? I mean, sometimes it's really easy to be an Ohio State football fan, right? Because it seems like they just keep winning, even when it seems like, oh, hey, maybe they're finally not. Oh, yeah. It's much harder to be a Pitt fan, right? Or a Penn State fan, uh, or a Michigan State fan. Or, right? I mean, it's harder to be some fans of other sports when the team just keeps letting you down. Or, hey, a Lions fan, right? <clears throat> it's hard to follow when it's not going well. It's hard to follow when it's not going well. And Jesus says when things aren't, gonna, when things aren't going well, there's going to be a whole lot of temptation to, to leave me and go follow somebody else or something else. Right? The life of the disciple is not going to be an easy walk in the park. Sometimes we in the church get sort of this bad habit of saying, you know, if we just follow Jesus, everything's going to be okay. And it will, but it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Following Jesus doesn't mean that our life is going to be easier. In fact, Jesus is saying, it's going to be harder. And this whole crowd of people who are excited about the things I'm doing right now, you need to know that if you're going to follow me, you need to choose me over other things. That I need to be your first priority. Right? The life of the disciple is one in which we recognize that there will be competing allegiances for our time and our attention. There will be many people and many relationships and many voices calling us to follow them. The disciple will be tempted to follow other people and other things other than Jesus. Right? And Jesus doesn't hide this from folks who are going to follow him. He's being upfront and honest. Listen, this isn't going to be a walk in the park, folks. It's going to be hard. See, the disciple will be tempted to put other things as a higher priority than following Jesus. And if you're not all in, if you're half-heartedly following, it's not going to work out. See, Jesus doesn't want anything less than our best. One of, uh, I have this kind of framed poster in my office, and if you could do the next slide there, Chris. Uh, one of the kind of quotes that always stays with me is by uh, a University of Oregon runner, uh, a guy by the name of Steve Prefontaine. And if you can't read it, uh, he says, to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift. And that quote has always sort of stuck with me because it is kind of demonstrates a few things. One, that our life is a gift. And if we give anything less than our best, we're telling God, you know what? Eh, it wasn't the greatest thing. It's not honoring the life that we have been given. It's not honoring the grace and the gifts that we have been given. One of the things that set Prefontaine apart is that he always ran out front and most 
intelligent, smart runners will say, no, 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 you don't want to run out front because then you're breaking the wind and you're tying yourself out. You want to you be the second person. You want to fall in right behind the lead person. Let them break the wind. Let them tire themselves out. And then when they're tired, you can pass by and, and finish and not be totally tired. And something about that just didn't stick with Prefontaine. He always ran out front because he said, if I'm not giving my best, I'm sacrificing the gift. And if someone's going to beat me, they're going to have to do it the hard way. They're going to have to catch me. So Jesus here is telling us to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift. Right? Because following me will be costly. It will be difficult. And we have these two parables of cost. Jesus talks about building a tower, and then he talks about being a king who has an army that's bigger than yours coming after you. Right? And these parables of cost talk about what we give up to acquire or to accomplish or to maintain or produce something. Right? Cost involves a measure of sacrifice. Cost requires effort and resources. And everything has a cost. Everything involves a cost. Right? There's the cost of choosing pie for dessert. It means I can't have the cake. Right? I mean, that's kind of a, an easy no-brainer. Of course, you take the cake rather than pie, right? <clears throat> right? The cost of taking an extra science class means I can't take gym. Or the cost of having children means the loss of personal free time or the loss of Having a, my aging parent move in and take care of them means the loss of my own personal free time. Right? The cost of listening and believing the serpent was to get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Right? Every choice that we make has a cost. And so in our first parable, the question is, can you afford to build the tower? Can you afford to follow Jesus? Right? Anybody who builds something figures out how much it's going to cost up front. And if they can't do it, there's no point in, in half building something because you'll be ridiculed. And Jesus is saying, count the cost. If you're not willing to give up things that you hold dear to follow me, just don't even start. And in the second one, there's this question of can you afford to oppose the one coming against you? In this parable, right, there's a king with 10,000 men, uh, 10,000 soldiers, and there's another king coming against him in war with 20,000. And so the king has to think, well, if I can beat his 20,000 with my 10,000, let's go, baby. But if I can't, I'm responsible for all of their lives. Right? Can you afford to refuse Jesus' demands? Or another way of asking it is, if Jesus is truly God, then are you strong enough to oppose him and survive? So the question that Jesus is asking all of these crowds who are following him is, are you serious? Are you serious? Are you devoted? Am I going to be your priority or is something else? What is it that you need to give up? See, the reality is that there will always be something that we prioritize ahead of God. We're not perfect, and we're not going to choose this well. It's the importance of um, the spiritual practice of repentance. Right? Unless we repent, we will perish. So the question for us to consider is what creature comfort is preventing me from following Jesus wholeheartedly? Right? What creature comfort is preventing me from following Jesus wholeheartedly? Or what sort of creature comfort is distracting me from following Jesus wholeheartedly? And this, this chapter of Luke ends with a, 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 a little saying that we did not read, but I'm going to read it for us. And Jesus says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile, and it is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. So he ends this whole thing with saying that salt that isn't salty is pointless. 
And so too, then, is the one who aimlessly and thoughtlessly attempts to follow Jesus. See, Jesus promises us a full and fulfilling lives, lives which have meaning and purpose, lives which have a point. But we must take up our cross daily. We must make him our first priority in our lives in order to experience the fullness of of a maturing life in Christ. And so Jesus comes to us each and every day with this same message, right? Following me is costly. Are you willing to pay the cost? Well, as we gather each and every week, we gather um, around God's word. We gather to tell the stories of God's interaction in the world. We We gather to tell the story of Jesus. And we remind ourselves of that big story that shapes and forms who we are each week when we profess our faith. And our profession continues to come from a a bunch of different scriptures uh, that reminds us of who God is and whose we are. And so if you're able to stand this morning, I invite you to stand as we remind ourselves uh, of who we are using the profession of faith. This is the good news which we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was raised on, he was raised on the third day. And that he appeared first to the women, and then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and God. Our next hymn is number 718, and it is that sort of reminder of what Jesus is calling us to, uh, that call to take up your cross. Um, and this is kind of a, a, a neat, um, well, it's a, a simple tune, uh, but it was written by a 19-year-old kid in Connecticut. Um, and it does sort of come to us as this reminder and this challenge. And so may it be our prayer asking God, yes, God, give me the strength to take up your cross, to take up our own crosses as we follow you.
be seated. And as we gather together each and every week, we do gather as God's people, God's family in conversation. Uh, for that is what prayer is, conversation with God. So as we gather together this morning, let us lift our hearts and our minds and our spirits to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for this day, for the gift of today, for the gift of life. Lord, as we rose from our beds this morning, uh, we are reminded of not only the, the gift that we are alive, but the gift of our new life in you. Lord, we give thanks that you do love us, that you call us to yourself. Lord, we thank you that you call us to follow after you as your disciples. And so, Lord, as we gather as your people, we pray that you would give us the strength and the courage um, to follow you, to prioritize you every day, to give us the strength to um, confess and repent when we are putting something else in front of you. Lord, we thank you for um, our lives and this world. We pray, Lord, that as your people, you would give us the strength and the courage to live out your character. Lord, that we would care for all of creation. Lord, that we would care for uh, all people in particular, the, the lost, the marginalized, the forgotten. Lord, we pray that we would um, love our enemies, that we would bless those who curse us. Lord, that when we are struck, we would turn the other cheek. And so as we gather together this morning, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would um, strengthen us to be your faithful people. Lord, that we would live out your character in the world. And so as we gather together, Lord, there are so many things in our hearts, in our minds that we want to pray for, joys to share, um, concerns and sorrows to pray and lift up to you. So, Lord, um, as we gather together, we share our joys and our concerns as a way of being in conversation with you and as a way of um, praying together as your family and community here. And so are there joys and concerns to share this morning? Yeah, Wendy. What was his name? So prayers for your boss's family. As he, your boss, Jeff, suddenly got sick and passed away over the weekend. Um, prayers for the family as they begin to sort of wrestle with what's next uh, in this new world that they find themselves in. Prayers for all of the, the company and the employees as uh, they're all, I imagine, sort of struggling with, okay, what do we do next? Um, prayers for for strength and comfort in the face of the unexpected. So, oh Lord, hear our prayer. Others this morning. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, what's their name? Thetis. Like venison, but with an F. <laughs> okay. Uh, prayers for the Fettison family as they also are mourning um, not being whole anymore. Uh, as they mourn the loss of a wife, of a mom, of a friend. Um, prayers of strength for them as they move forward. And prayers uh, of peace and comfort. So, oh Lord, hear our prayer. Yeah, others this morning. Yeah, Simon. Yeah. 
Yeah, prayers for your grandmother uh, and the family as uh, prayers of healing for her uh, as she's broken her pelvis. Um, prayers that even in the midst of dementia that it wouldn't be so unsettling or jarring. Um, but prayers of peace and comfort for her and the family. Um, oh, Lord, hear our prayer. Joel, do you have a prayer? Yeah. Yeah, prayers of thanks for Bill. Um, mm, so prayers of thanks for Bill, who has passed, um, but who is now with Jesus. Uh, prayers for you, Joel, and all of Bill's friends and family, as they will probably miss seeing Bill on a regular basis. And so prayers of comfort and peace for you and for his whole family. Yeah. So, that's perfect. So, oh Lord, hear our prayer. Others this morning. Yeah. Yeah, prayers for your upcoming uh, celebrations of a wedding for your daughter and son-in-law. Um, prayers especially for your son-in-law who uh, has hurt himself um, and torn bicep and tricep. Prayers that uh, surgery isn't necessary, but that he can heal. Um, and prayers for comfort and peace in the midst of what is a bit of a busy time uh, in their lives. And so, oh Lord, hear our prayer. Well, in this quiet moment, may God hear the prayers of this, his, uh, his people. Lord, we give thanks that you hear us when we pray, that you desire to hear us. Lord, we give thanks um, that we can gather as your people in conversation. Um, we give thanks that you love us and that you hear us. And Lord, hear us now as we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as we prepare for our offering this morning, we begin with <clears throat> blessing uh, two uh, prayer shawls this morning. Um, the first is for uh, Crew William Corsi, the grandson of Michelle Sebastian, uh, and the other is for Jessica and Marcus McCowan as they prepare to welcome uh, a little girl later on this year in November. Um, and so as we, as we gather, we, um, we offer these as uh, a prayer of this congregation, but we also want to bless them, that those who receive these shawls would feel the tangible presence of God's love in their life. And so let us, uh, using the prayer shawl blessing, bless these shawls. Gracious, loving, and healing God, bless these shawls that they may be tangible evidence of the love and prayers of this congregation. Bless the ones who receive these shawls Give them comfort, peace, healing, and strength. Remind them that they are loved and never forgotten. We ask your blessing on all who are lonely, sick, and suffering. In the name of Jesus Christ, 
Amen. And they are a reminder to us that as the ushers come forward, we um, can use all sorts of things to bless God for all of our lives. Our time, our talents, and our money uh, are given to us to care for and steward so that we may bless others. And so as the plates go by this morning, it is a reminder that it's an opportunity for us um, to bless God, to give thanks for what he has given to us uh, and to steward that well in order to give him glory. So may we live with God's character in being joyful and generous givers. Gracious God, we do give you thanks for these gifts and the lives that they represent. We pray that you would give the leaders of this congregation wisdom to know how to steward them well. We pray that you would multiply them, that we would be able to do your good work, that we would be able to live your good news here and around the world. And all of God's people said, amen. <clears throat> well, as we prepare to go from here into the rest of our holiday weekend, uh, and into our week, may we go as God's loving and faithful followers. May we go as Jesus' disciples who prioritize our relationship with him above all else. And as we go, um, we are charged with this. May God bless us all with discomfort, with easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that we will live deeply and from the heart. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people so that we will work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who mourn so we will reach out our hand to them and turn mourning into joy. And may God bless us with just enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world so that we will do those things that others say cannot be done. And as we go, go with this blessing. May the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord, Jesus Christ, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do God's will, working among all people that which is pleasing in God's sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now let us go with song and passing Christ's peace. Mm -hmm.